Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. I've heard from some that, oh no, the Catholics changed it. They, they, uh, they, they made uh, Sunday the Sabbath. Let me, let me assure you, no one on planet Earth can change what God has established forever. The seventh is the day of rest. That's the day he rested. It's a part of the covenant he made with Israel forever. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath. Oh. In today's broadcast, we have a new two-part study from Pastor Sam entitled, Servants, Stewards, and Shepherds. As we continue on in the Apostle Paul's third missionary journey, we now come to Acts chapter 20, where we see Paul revisiting some of the churches and church leaders that he has planted, along with a visit with the Ephesian elders. Sam takes a closer look at the Apostle Paul himself in this chapter, so let's listen in. I thought I knew, I think I know, the difference between faith and presumption. Faith is taking God at his word and then acting on his word. Presumption, well, it actually can look like faith, at least from the outside, but the difference being it's what I'm thinking or what I'm wanting or what I'm desiring and think, well, he'd have to be okay with that. And thinking that's going to work out the same way it does when he sends me on a mission and he empowers me to accomplish it. I had an experience, of course, last weekend that really brought this to light. And again and again in this chapter, we'll see the difference between faith and presumption. God gave me fresh eyes for Acts 20 because Saturday night I was completely healthy. Well, as healthy as I get at my age with all the physical things I deal with. But I felt great, and I taught, and I presumed that meant I would be fine Sunday morning. Now, that's a logical assumption, by the way. Ever since I began doing Saturday night and the three Sunday mornings, I've always been able to do both. If I felt kind of queasy Saturday night, I prayed, Lord, either show me that I'm sick or just heal me. And usually it's heal me or show me that I'm sick. But either way, it's the same prayer. And uh, in this case, I just thought, well... It's so complicated, and and for sure, now that I've done Saturday night, I won't get sick. Well, 2.30 in the morning, I woke up and found out I was wrong. And you know how the Bible says that there are things that should never come out of your mouth? And the Bible doesn't mention this particular thing. But I'm pretty sure God's intention is the plumbing would keep things flowing the other way. And uh, in my case, not so. And so I was just so sick, and I was like, Lord, this just, what happened? And, and he's like, you're sick. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know. In any case, I'm learning that just because I think I know something or I understand it theologically or biblically, until I walk through a situation that says, well, it's not exactly as you thought it was. I don't want to assume anything. I just want to know what's absolute And I want to follow Jesus' example and Paul's example. And that's what we have here in Acts 20. We have Paul fleshing out for us what it looks like when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And we're going to see everything he is an example of or exhorts us to or explains. He learned it from Jesus. We read in chapter 20, verse 1, after the uproar had ceased. This was the uproar that came about because Paul was preaching in Ephesus and living there and ministering, and so many people were coming to Christ and turning from idols and idolatry. Well, it was big business. It wasn't just a religious experience. It was a financial experience for the city of Ephesus, and so it led to a near riot, and basically he had to leave town. So after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself. He embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. When he'd gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sophater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also, Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, Timothy and Tychicus and Tromepheus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. Now, you read this and, and you're like, okay, well, what am I supposed to glean from this? It's very simple. Paul is retracing his steps. He's been preaching the gospel and establishing churches 
everywhere the Lord would let him go or lead him to. And so what he's doing is he's headed back toward Jerusalem. His goal is to be there for the day of Pentecost. He'll say so in a moment. And, uh, and he's taking nothing for granted. He's like, he knows it's if the Lord wills, he wants it. But he knows, hey, faith says wherever the Lord takes me. Presumption says I want to go there. But in any case, here we find him retracing his steps because he wants to make sure that the churches he's establishing are having that Acts 2.42 experience where the disciples we read in Jerusalem continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They were in the word of God daily, in fellowship. And it means more than hanging out. It, it, it implies hanging out with Jesus being in the center, a recognition that where two or three were gathered together in his name, there he was and is in the midst. And then in the breaking of bread, that could be a meal, but because fellowship almost always in their culture included a meal, it's more likely pointing us to the reality of the communion service, which pointed them continually as it does us to the cross. So they're in the word and they're fellowshipping together, all things in common. They're sharing in communion to remember the cross, why they were Christians in the first place, and then praying. That was the experience of the Jerusalem church. It kept them safe. It made them fruitful. And Paul wants to make sure that these outposts, that these outreaches are having that same experience. Now, we get to a couple doctrinal and practical issues as we press on. It was the first day of the week, we read in verse 7, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. And there were many lamps in the upper room, where they gathered together. We'll pause there and then we'll get the rest of the story as we press on. First day of the week. For us here at Calvary Chico, it's not a major issue what day we worship. We're pretty much holding services every day of the week. So we're coming together continuously to worship the Lord. But we do know that there are Christians that are very hung up on, well, no, the Sabbath is the day to worship. The, the seventh day, it's the day to worship. And some of those have come to the conclusion that, well, if you're not worshiping on the Sabbath, you're not worshiping acceptably. Some even believe that Sunday worship is the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation. Now, that's an absurdity because I'd be like, oh, you worship on Sunday, you can't work, you can't buy, you can't sell. No, the mark of the beast is something entirely different. If you haven't studied Revelation, you should. But here's the thing. Paul addresses this issue elsewhere and just says, some esteem one day or, or every day alike, others esteem one day above another. He says, be fully convinced or assured in your own mind. Why? Well, whatever is in a faith is sin. In other words, if I think that Sunday is the only day to worship or Saturday is the only day to worship and I, and I do something different than that, I'm violating my own conscience. And that's sin. Now, Paul's take and mine, by the way, is that every day is a day we should be worshiping, serving, representing, sharing our Lord. I know the Sabbath is the seventh day. I've heard from some that, oh, no, the Catholics changed it. They, they, uh, they, they made uh, Sunday the Sabbath. Let me let me assure you, no one on planet Earth can change what God has established forever. The seventh is the day of rest. That's the day he rested. It's a part of the covenant he made with Israel forever. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath. The eighth day is the first day of the week. Now, here's where the confusion started. God first saved Jews and, and Jewish proselytes, people who had come from Gentile backgrounds but had become Jewish, they were worshiping on the Sabbath. The synagogue service, the temple service, it was all centered around the Sabbath. So when they became Christians, they continued to worship as they always had on the Sabbath. But the Gentile churches in Europe, most of our ancestors, well, they come to Christ, they have no connection to the law or the Sabbath. And as we saw in Acts 15, when they dealt with this issue of do they need to be circumcised, do they need to keep the law of Moses, they said no, no idolatry, no immorality, uh, keep them from food strangled and sacrifice the idols. And, but no mention of the ceremonial law, no mention of the Sabbath, none of those things. 
And so what happens is you have the Gentile churches basically worshiping from the get-go on the first day of the week. Why? They're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're here to do today. Every time we gather, we're preaching that Jesus died for our sins, but we never stop there. It always goes from died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day. That's what we celebrate. That's why we're together. Now, we're studying, so I'll be able to say when I stand before the Lord, I haven't shunned to declare the whole counsel of God, as Paul will say in this passage, and that you'll be able to say, I knew your will because I read it and I heard it and I did it. Well, in any case, they're meeting on the first day of the week. And when the disciples came together to break bread, and and, and Paul spoke, it says, and continued his message till midnight. Now listen, the meal would be in the afternoon. This isn't like an 8 p.m. service that's going four hours. They'd eat in the afternoon, and then Paul starts teaching. He knows he's leaving town, so he wants to make sure he can share everything that's on his heart with them. And he goes on to midnight, and then things get a little crazy. But before we get there... There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. It really touches on the issue of not just, you know, when to worship, but where to worship. I made mention of it in my prayer where two or three are gathered together in his name. There he is in the midst. So the best place to worship the Lord is at home when you wake up with your family, if you're fortunate enough to have one. And then at work, if you can even get one other person, if you go to work and you're like, there are no believers in my workplace, well, then pray. Because God certainly wants you to have fellowship. Pray and then share the gospel. Someone's going to come to the Lord or you'll get fired and get a job where you can work with Christians. But uh, just don't share on the boss's time, right? That's that's an issue. But anyway, the, the point is, is that wherever we are, we are the church. We don't have to get together to have church. We are his separated ones, his ecclesia, the called out ones. And so they're meeting in an upper room. That was the room available to them. They didn't actually build the church, that is, until like the third century or so. It's pretty much whatever building was available, they would use it. That's the Calvary Chapel model, by the way. We first met in a storefront at Fifth and Mangrove. And then we met in a little church at 16th and Hemlock. And then we rented the Veterans Hall and Chico High School and and, uh, the Durham Vets Hall for a season. And we were just anywhere and everywhere that we could be. Now we're in this theater. We'll be here unless the Lord has other plans. We'll be here for the rest of our time together. Probably the rest of mine either way. But uh, in, in any case, it isn't about the where. It's the who and the what. Why do we come together? It's to worship him. to to study his word, to get our marching orders from the Lord. Well, in the window, we read in verse 9, sat a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep as Paul continued speaking, and he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now, it's a horrific outcome, but you have to appreciate the humor in the situation, and here's why. Eutychus will forever be known as the guy who not only fell asleep in church, but fell out the window. You see, it's in, in a moment, Paul raises him from the dead. But I think when people meet him, they're not like, you're a guy that got raised from the dead. No, that's they talked to Lazarus about that. But Eutychus, you're the guy that fell asleep in church, dude. And listen, by the way, he's in a window and it, and it, and it says he was falling asleep. Then it says he he was overcome by sleep. That means he's in a truly deep sleep. And and here's the difference. When you're starting to fall asleep, and I know some of you are like, yeah, I've had that experience. Yes, believe it or not, I know. And and, and here's why. Even though I can't see real well, real far, when people are falling asleep, there's this automatic built-in response that does that, you know, you kind of jerk. And and it's like, I noticed that, by the way, and I get a kick out of it, but I'm not offended. I know God gives his loved ones rest. I understand. but, But the point is... This guy doesn't have that automatic reflex. I mean, if he had, he would have been, whoa, I'm falling, you know, or I'm waking up, or I'm falling asleep. And instead, he just falls out and falls down dead. Well, Paul went down and fell on him. Now, it doesn't say jump down. He, he went down. and Because ordinarily, if you fall in three stories, you don't need anyone to fall on you. But uh, he embraces him and says, don't trouble yourself, for his life is in him. And when he'd come up and broken bread and eaten, he talked a while, even till daybreak. You would think Paul would have figured it out. Hey, if people are falling asleep at midnight, you don't go till 6 a.m. 
But Paul knows that this will potentially be his last time with them. And he wants to make sure he can share everything he can think of that will be useful to them. And then he's going to write them letters because he's going to remember, oh yeah, a couple more things. Or I want to remind you of these things. Well, in any case, he stays with them till daybreak and he departs and they brought the young man in alive and they were not a little comforted. Now, we read sometime earlier that God did unusual miracles through Paul. It was related to the headbands and the things that people were taking and sending and laying on their relatives and people were being healed. Well, listen, raising someone from the dead falls into the category of an unusual miracle. It's not like that happened every day for Paul. And, and I'm thinking God wants us to consider this because I'm sure few, if any of us, would say, well, yeah, I expect someday God would raise someone from the dead through me. Or, or yeah, when I go out, I just pray for people and I expect, you know, they'll be healed, not of a flu or, or a cold, but of some, you know, congenital disease. The reality is most of us don't expect that because we've never had that experience. So track with me on this for a second. Paul never had that experience either until the first time God did it, you see. He had never healed anyone until God put it on his heart to say, be healed, and then it worked, and he's like, wow. And then he's like, be healed, and it worked, and it's wow. But then here's what happens. At some point, he says to a friend, be healed, and it doesn't happen. Why? Because there's a difference in faith and presumption. And even if we have faith that God will use us in some way, it only works if that's what God wants to do. Paul prayed for friends, and they didn't get healed. He prayed because he had a thorn in his flesh. And he said, Lord, remove it. I could be so much more effective, so much more fruitful. If I wasn't laboring and struggling under this thorn, God's response to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so it's important that we see it. We don't want to limit what God can do because we've never had the experience, but we don't want to presume that, well, just because we've had an experience, God will always do that thing through us. The reality is, with God, nothing is impossible. And we need to remember, God can do anything through anyone at any time. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. With God, nothing shall be impossible. You know, the first time you read those words is when Mary asked, well, you know, the virgin birth thing, she was a little confused about that. How exactly will that work? And he says, oh, spirit of God, power of God, but with God, nothing will be impossible. So important to see it. Well, I am reminded of one more thing. Someone had sent me a story recently uh, about a situation similar, confusing to some. But anyway, there's this little boy and he's in the church lobby of a church. And and they have some pictures of soldiers who had fallen. It was a little memorial uh, service thing they'd set up. And he was puzzled by it. He's looking at it and trying to put it together. And the pastor comes up. He can see that the boy's puzzled. So he's like... Uh, or do you have questions about this? And he's like, yeah. And, and, and he goes, who are they? And he says, well, son, these are people that died in the service. Now he looks even more concerned. He gets this look and he says, which one, 830 or 1030? <laughs> but again, it's very rare for such a thing to happen. It can happen. And, 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 and so for Eutychus, it's, he falls out. The Lord raises them back up through Paul, and then Paul continues to teach them until the break of day. Well, verse 13, we continue tracking with Luke and with Paul and those who were traveling. And and he says, then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asos. They're intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when we met at Asos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene, and we sailed from there. And the next day, opposite Chios, the following day, we, were, we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogillium. The next day, we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now, you see Paul's desire here, but he's not taking anything for granted. He doesn't want to go to Asia because he knows that will make it less likely he'll make it to the feast there in Jerusalem. And at the same time, he wants to meet with the Ephesian elders because he's concerned for them. He's concerned for their flock. And so he sends for them. And that's exactly what happens from Miletus, verse 17. He's sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Here we see Paul beginning to share 
the example he'd been to them. That'll be followed by an exhortation, a command to watch out and be careful and stay on guard, protect and, and, and feed and, and care for the flock of God that they were overseers of. But, but first his example, and I mentioned it earlier in the introduction, Paul can say, as we want to be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. So everything he's doing, he learns from Jesus and he's representing Jesus. So that makes perfect sense. He says to them, verse 18, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia and what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. You have to see it. Paul did more than preach Jesus. He represented Jesus. He understood he was an ambassador of Jesus Christ. So he says, first of all, he was serving the Lord. When he was imprisoned, he considered himself a prisoner of the Lord. When he served, he considered that he was serving the Lord. And this makes sense because the Lord, of course, didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. He has Jesus' example. We also have Jesus' exhortation to the first disciples. Now, Paul was not a part of that privileged little group that spent those three years with Jesus, but the exhortation stands. What I've done to you, I want you to do for one another. And, and what was that exactly? Take the lowest place. Do the service that Jesus would do if he were there on the scene, recognizing when we've done it to the least of these, we've done it unto him. Paul wasn't just a servant, though. We read here that he was a humble servant. He served with all humility. And of course, again, this makes sense. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. That word lowly means humble, meek. Not weak, but meek. Humble. And he says, if you'll do that, you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Paul recognized that you can't rightly represent the Lord. You can't preach the message and not be a humble servant. Because the lack of humility, the arrogance, or the, anything that would be the opposite of or, or taint the, the nature and character of Jesus, well, it taints the message that we bring of Jesus. Not just a servant, not just a humble servant, a caring, compassionate, humble servant. He mentions his tears and his trials. We'll come back to the trials, but it's interesting to, to read that, that as he ministered to them, there were tears. He, he tells us at one point, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Paul wasn't embarrassed to say, man, we, just, we, we were as tender and affectionate to you as a nursing mother would have been to her children. A man of sorrows, by the way, again, our Lord is called the man of sorrows who's well acquainted with grief. You read it in Isaiah 53. So Paul gives us the picture. He's serving and he's a humble servant and he's a caring, compassionate, humble servant. And he's, he's keeping back nothing. He's proclaiming the whole counsel of God, teaching and preaching and giving and caring and compassionate, humble servant. If you had to nail that down or, or get its essence, he would say, I'm a disciple maker. And so he was living the life of a disciple as an example to those who were becoming disciples. As we see the Apostle Paul's servant nature here in our text today, we're reminded of what Jesus told his disciples in Mark 10:45, where he said, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So what characteristics of their hearts does Paul and Jesus' desire and willingness to serve show us? Well, it shows that they put others' needs and desires before their own, regardless of what that might cost them. Our own willingness to serve will come directly out of a heart that puts the other people in our lives before our own. And in this way, we are loving those people the way that Jesus loved the church. We learn that our love for one another is not a feeling that we have for them, it's a choice. 
It's a choice to serve others and deny ourselves in the process. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down The Calvary Road. And your grace, it surrounds me. And your peace, it fills my soul. And your gift of salvation in your Son.